All right, so then moving forward here, we had different forms of the quadratic function, okay? Um, and we worked a lot with standard form, okay? And, and again, if you're stuck, when in doubt, change it to standard form, okay? Um, that's that ax squared plus bx plus c, all right? With the intercept form, this is dealing with the x-intercepts, okay? This is dealing with the x-intercepts, where the, the x-intercept of the graph is r10 and r20, right? So you could make this one, so r1 would be negative three, because this is at negative three, zero, and this one's at one, zero. So r2 would be one, right? And so this is what, what your intercept form looks like. Now, you could only have, you could only have one x-intercept, right? So if, if r2 is non-existent, right, then you would have no value there. It would be minus nothing, right? It'd be minus nothing if there was only one x-intercept, all right? And then the vertex form, that's that y minus k equals a x minus h squared, right? Where, where h k is the vertex, right? And, and each one of these forms has their, their value, okay? So, for example, if we look at the vertex form, okay, you immediately know what the vertex coordinates are, right? It's hk. So, you would just look for that h value, look for that k value, and you would know it's there, right? And, it, and if, again, if anything was not there, so if this was just y equals this form, but you were told it's the vertex form, then k would be zero. k would be zero, same thing if it was y minus some number equals a x squared, right? There was no, no h value, that would mean h is equal to zero, right? So this immediately gives you a lot of information, okay? Same thing if you have it in this intercept form, which is what we're more familiar with, right? This is our, this is our factored version. Well, we can tell exactly where our x-intercepts are right from looking at it, okay? And again, the standard form is the one that we're, we're most familiar with. We're able to do a lot of things because it's in that A, we've got those variables A, B, and C, all right? Um, and, and one thing I want to clarify here in case I wasn't um, very clear, it's R1, so it's minus R1. So the coordinate is R1, 0, right? So if this is plus 2, if it's plus 2, our coordinates got to be negative 2, right? You got to make sure that you're, you're careful with that minus sign. Okay, so whatever it's minus whatever, okay, that would mean it's a positive x coordinate. Okay, because think about it. This is like our zero product rule where we set x minus r1 equal to zero. So when you take and you solve for x, you end up getting the opposite of, of this r1 value. Okay, so each of those, those have their own value there. All right. Um, and, and perfect, I just walked you through this verbally, um, but just to re-highlight, okay, so each, each uh, form can tell you a lot of things about the graph. So for standard form, x is equal to b, sorry, negative b over 2a for the vertex, right? To get the y value, we would just plug that back in and solve. The axis of symmetry is the same as the x coordinate for the vertex. You would find the y-intercept by having x equal to zero, you would plug in additional values for x to generate points, right? And again, you just pick values. Personally, I pick values on the left of the vertex and on the right of the vertex. Uh, and, and that's how I, I make my graph there. All right. Um, and, and the one they, they um, missed here, because we've talked about it a whole lot, is how to get the x-intercepts, right? So getting the x-intercept would be setting... Um, would be setting, sorry, um, would be setting y equal to zero, right? So that, that's, that's how we would get the x-intercept. Same thing we've been talking about a lot in pre-calc. Um, for the intercept form, right, you get the intercepts. So you could graph those immediately based on, on what you're subtracting, all right? The axis of symmetry is halfway in between those, right? So if you wanted, you'd be r1 plus r2 divided by 2. Right, so that would give us that x coordinate for the axis of symmetry. All right. Then that would also give us the x coordinate for our vertex. So that halfway point, we would then just plug that back in to solve for our y. Um, and then same thing, plug in additional values for x. You can either plug in values on both sides or you plug in values on one side of the vertex and make sure that you make an opposite point um, along the axis of symmetry. 
All right. Um, and then for the vertex form, we get the vertex immediately. We know the axis of symmetry. We can find the y-intercept by plugging x equals. We can find the x-intercepts by plugging y equals zero. Um, and then we, again, continue to just plug in points and solve. All right. Um, and this is where we have some new stuff. Okay, so we have some new stuff and I didn't make any videos for these. I wanted you to make sure, uh, I wanted to make sure I didn't overwhelm you with videos that you had to do, okay? Um, so for these here though, we basically have a couple moves that we can do with functions, right? So with, with the graphs of functions, we can do these things called translations, which are moving them, right? We can move them up, down, left, right, okay? We can reflect them, which means we can basically mirror them across an image. So we can do across the X axis or we can do across the Y axis, right? So, so think about it just like a mirror, all right? And then we can do this thing called stretch or shrink, right? So stretch vertically, stretch horizontally, um, shrink vertically, shrink horizontally, right? And, and, and all of these are based on different things. So for example, if C is greater than zero, then Y equals the function plus C moves upward, okay? So, so how this reads is, is if C is, is a number greater than zero, if it's a positive number, and we say Y equals our original function plus some value, all it does is it takes the entire graph and moves it up, moves it up, okay? based on how many positive values you wanted to add, all right? Opposite, if we had C is less than zero, means it's a negative number, okay? Obviously, we associate numbers with, or sorry, negative numbers with downwards, all right? Um, now, here's where the difference is, is, is if we have the function plus C, or if we have C added to X of the function, right? So this is where we have the entire function as is and then add X. And this is if every place you see X, you add X plus C instead, right? So again, whatever's in the parentheses here is what actually gets plugged into those X values. So for this one here, if we, if we have F of X plus C, it just shifts it left if, that positive, if it's a positive value, all right? But if it's a negative value, it moves it right. So it moves it in the positive direction. All right. Um, for, for this one here, again, it's, it's being careful with is the negative sign inside the function or outside of the function? All right. So for this one, we've got f of x, which is our normal function, right? So if we imagine our normal function here, you've got negative f of x, which means every positive value becomes negative, every negative value becomes positive, all right? So basically, it's through the x-axis. So if your x-axis is running horizontally, right, you have your value here, and then you basically flip it across the x-axis, right? So you flip it across the x-axis. If we've got um, f of x and f, now the negative sign is inside, right? So we're taking now negative X, that's through the Y axis. So you have your Y axis is going vertically, so you have your function, and then you take it and you flip it across the Y axis. All right, and then finally here, stretching or shrinking, okay? Um, so this is multiplying or, uh, sorry, this is multiplying the entire function. Okay, so instead of, instead of adding, right, instead of adding, we are now multiplying, okay? And that's going to affect the entire thing. So again, if the value is greater than one, it's going to stretch. If the value is less than one, it's going to shrink, okay? And again, if it's, if it's inside, it's going to be, um, if, it's, if it's inside the parentheses, it's going to be horizontal. And if it's outside the parentheses, it's going to be vertical, all right? So same thing. If it's, Outside the parentheses, it's going to be vertical. If it's inside, it's going to be horizontal. If it's outside, it's vertical. Inside, it's horizontal. Outside, vertical. Inside, horizontal. Right? So, so again, that, that's, a, that's a pattern that you can pick up on. All right. Um, 
This one here, solving quadratic equations. Okay, so this one should be really, really, really familiar for, for my Algebra 2 kids, okay? Um, so you have a lot of different ways of doing this now. And again, I, unless it specifically tells you which way to do it, you get to choose, right? It, it's, it's whatever is easiest or best for you. So you can either do factoring, which is what we've worked on a ton. You can do the square roots method, right? So, so um, perfect squares. You can use the quadratic formula, which Again, is, is easier if, um, or that's the one you use when it's not as easy to see the factors or the, the square root answers. Um, and then obviously graphing, right? That one's pretty pretty simple there too, um, depending on, on if your graph is, is on lines directly or if it's halfway in between, okay? Um, Factoring changes the quadratic function into intercept form so you can use the zero product rule, right? And you can find the zeros. So, um, that's again just saying it goes from standard to that intercept form, which is what we're really, really comfortable with. And the intercept form is easy for us to find the zeros. Um, the method of square roots, you have to have, again, you have to have both of them being squared. And you could even complete the square if you want, right? But the, the issue we have with this one is just you have to remember when you take the square root, you've got the plus or the minus answer. So you've got to have the positive version and the negative version. All right, same thing with the quadratic formula. You've got to remember this right here. You've got the positive version of this and the negative version. So you've got to make sure you carry both of those out. All right. Um, and then again, this one was just talking about making sure you know the difference between root, zero, and x intercept. Okay. Um, again, all of them effectively mean the same thing and they're pretty interchangeable, but just be careful to make sure that if it's asking you for um, plotting the x-intercept, you gotta make sure that you're again going on a graph versus if it's saying solve for the zeros, you gotta make sure you, you get a value, like a number value, okay? Um, all right, and then again, we spent a lot of time on this uh, last class, so I wanna highlight it here. Okay, imaginary unit i is defined as square root of negative one, right? So if you have um, the square root of six, negative 16, like we showed before, that ends up with four i. Okay, that ends up with four i. Um, okay, so then again, remember, um, okay, so, the straight vertical lines up and down mean absolute value, okay, right? That was from um, early, early pre-calc um, and even algebra two, all right? So those vertical lines up and down mean the absolute value, okay, the absolute value. Now, when you put it underneath the square root, it denotes the principal square root, okay? It means principal square root, all right? Um, and and for for, what that really means there is, is, um, is like I said, let me, and let me pull that one back up here. Okay. So if I told you square root of negative 16, right? If I told you square root of negative 16, okay. What this is effectively saying here is that we have the square root of negative one multiplied by the square root of our absolute value of 16, right? And that, that's what we're saying. Because the square root of 16, we know is four, right? So what it's saying here is that, okay, well, if we look at that, I know that this is gonna be I times by my square root of my absolute value of 16. And as we found out, we can solve this because we know the square root of 16 is four. So this ends up with I four or, oops, sorry, I four, or the way you're more commonly gonna see it as is four I, four I. Okay, so again, this is just saying you've gotta pull that negative value out and then, and then continue on with the um, square root, okay? Same thing, even if, even if we just have, even if we just have square root of 17, right? If you don't want to break that down any further or not much further, you can just write it as I square root of 17, or sorry, square root of 17. 
right? That, that takes that negative value out and it makes it a lot more uh, manageable because if you actually had to solve this, right? If we actually had to solve this, you could plug in square root of 17 into your calculator, right? And you could get a number. Um, you could get a number out of that. Let me pull up my digital calculator for you guys here so you can see what I'm talking about. Sorry, it's taking a second to load here. All right, but you could actually plug into your calculator square root of 17 and you will get out a number. It's not gonna be a, a solid number, right? Or a whole number, um, but you will be able to plug it in and, and see. So anytime here. All right, so if I shared my screen with you guys, right, so I can plug in square root of 17. I can plug in square root of 17, right? That'll give me a number. So then effectively what this would turn into would be 4.123i or 4.12i, right? So you could, you could actually do that. Um, but if I tried to plug in square root of negative 17, right? It's going to say not a real calculator. For example, okay, so square root of negative one is invalid, right? So, so you got to make sure, again, you can pull out that negative value, negative one value, and make that um, your, your I. All right. So then moving forward here, standard form of a complex number is given by A plus BI, right? Where BI is the imaginary part, okay? Um, moving forward here with things we already talked about here, the discriminant. Okay. So that's that thing underneath the square root symbol. All right. Um, if this is greater than zero, so if this is a positive number, but it's not a perfect square, then you're going to have two, two, um, numbers. So if that is greater than zero, it's going to have two real numbers. All right. Um, if it is a perfect square, though, you're going to have two rational numbers, okay? And so what that means is the example of that is it's saying um, perfect, right? Square root of 16, that's a perfect square, right? We can do that. That's going to give us four, okay? So that one would be our example down here. The solution is is a perfect square, all right? But an example of not a perfect square would, okay, a solution of not a perfect square would be again that square root of 17, okay? So this is gonna result in two answers where we have um, our number, so our real number, so our A plus our irrational part, plus the, square root of seven and a minus the square root of seven, 17, okay? Um, if b squared, so that if the discriminant is equal to zero, um, then you're going to have one root, okay? You're gonna have one root, okay? Because plus or minus zero is not gonna change anything, right? So it's gonna be plus or minus zero, so you're gonna have one root. Um, and then if it's greater than zero, you're gonna have two complex numbers. All right, so you're gonna have two complex numbers. So now instead of just having, instead of just having this A uh, plus 17, you're gonna have something where it's gonna be A plus 17I, right? Or you could even have it be A plus 4I, right? But, but you're gonna have that I part somewhere, okay? So you're gonna have that I part somewhere, which just makes it that complex number. All right, and we, we already talked about what this means in terms of, okay, if I have two, if I have two roots, it means it's gonna cross the x-axis twice. If I have one, it means it's gonna touch once. And then if I have zero, it's not gonna cross my x-axis at all. All right, and then there's a ton of applications of quadratic functions, okay? So talking about figuring out the maximum height of a toss or figuring out the lowest part of a valley, right? Um, and, and really, this is a super, super good slide to have handy or to, you know, at least have the highlights written down here. But the main part of this is, is, is solving word problems, okay? So 
I'm hoping by now, especially with the repetitive double class, that you all can solve mathematically the problem, okay? But something that I know I definitely talked about in my, my science class here, and I'm sure your teachers talked about it too, knowing them, is that solving the word problems, the hardest part is setting up the problem, okay? The hardest part is setting up the problem. So these are really good steps just in general for solving any problem that has to deal with mathematical quantities, right? Read the problem, actually read it, sit down, focus, make sure you understand it, okay? Make a drawing or a picture, right? So when we were talking about that cannonball one, they, they drew a picture and you guys know I'm not the best artist here. So doesn't really matter what it looks like. The whole goal is for it to be able to help you, right? Then think of equations that could help, right? So even if you have all of your notes next to you, you know it's gonna be one of the equations that we've used in this unit, all right? Um, determine what kind of information is called for. So for example, figure out what you're looking for, right? That, that's what it's saying. Figure out what you're looking for, what parts do you have and what parts do you still need, all right? Then once you actually solve it, okay, once you actually solve it, read the results or re actually figure out what it's saying, right? So when we did that, that cannonball one, okay, we got a negative value, which would mean we're setting up a trampoline behind our guy. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so you gotta make sure that your answer is logical, right? I think we even talked about like, you can't buy half of a soda, okay? So you gotta make sure your answer makes sense. And then if they're asking for a specific, um, number right they might ask you for something in feet so when you write your final answer you've got to make sure you've got your units right is it feet is it meters is it miles per hour right figure out that you've got the units because that's where you're going to lose a lot of little points is if you don't attach the units or you don't attach the right units okay and then finally as always double check right if you reread the question and it's saying where should we set the trampoline up uh, in terms of feet away from our guy, right? You might realize, oh, crud, I didn't attach that unit of measurement. I know it's in feet, so here, let's add a foot there. Or if it says, um, figure out where to set the trampoline up and does this make sense, explain, right? You gotta make sure you do that second part of the question, okay? Um, so so that's, that's this first, first review here, okay? I want to pause for a second. Does anyone have any immediate questions here, guys, on, on what this is asking us to do? All right. Okay. And again, you can always reach out to me after you're done. You can even always, again, I really, really suggest those live tutors. They're like instantaneous. It's like I aming a teacher. It's amazing. All right. Um, and then something I want to just point out here, okay, um, I know we haven't spent a ton of time on it, so I want to spend some time here. That that second, okay, that second review is about your calculator, okay? Um, and, and I don't want to spend um, too terribly long here because as you're going to notice, we all have different calculators. And even the calculator I'm showing you is um, this one called Inspire, okay? So it's not even the same calculator that you guys have. So I apologize. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have every calculator version available. I wish I could. Um, all right. But um, one of the, the main things here is this Y equals. All right. So for me, hold on. Sorry. Nope. I don't want to save it. All right. So for me, I have this button where it says graph. Right, and again, this is why it's not super valuable for me to show you, but if you buy this Inspire calculator, it has like a totally um, different, different platform than you guys. Um, and again, I wish I, wish I could actually um, show you what this would look like here. All right, but for, for me here, uh, for me, it's not gonna be super valuable. So, um, what I will point you to here is, is this guy, right? What I will point you to here is this calculator review. Um, and I will just say that I do have handheld, I have both versions of the calculators that you guys use. So um, I have the TI-83 and I have the TI-84. So if 
when you're doing your test or if when you're doing your practice problems, you, you have a specific question. Again, you can reach out to the, the Apex, um, like instant chat, I am tutor, or you can let me know and I can always walk you through it. Like we could have a separate Zoom call and I can, I can walk you through it um, with the calculators that I have in hand. Um, but unfortunately, I, I don't have the capability of showing you that here. All right. But um, something that's really cool is, is graphing the quadratic function. Right, so um, I, as, as I mentioned to you at least a couple times, I believe, you can actually just plot what the lines will look like and it will give you a general shape of, of the graph. Um, and if you have a, a nice enough calculator, you can actually scroll through and it will tell you um, in your window, like when Y equals three, X equals this, right? And you can actually type that in. And that's a, a really nice way of checking to make sure that, that what you calculated is correct. Um, um, and again, I, I like to personally do it just, just to, to graph it and, and see. But like, for example, here, calculating values from a graph, right? So if you plugged in your x squared minus x minus 6, you should generate a graph that looks like this, right? Um, and, and you can use this multiple ways. So the first way I'll, I'll tell you is, is if you started with a graph that looks like this, okay? And it asked you to solve for the... It asks you to solve for the um, equation, okay? Once you solve for your equation, you could plug this back in and see if you got a graph at the exact same point, right? Um, and if you did, then you, again, it's a quick, easy way of checking, all right? But um, the other thing you can do is once you plot your line, you can hit this value button. So you hit calculate and then value, Right? And, and depending on how you set it, it might say Y equals or X equals. And that would be a really good way of checking. So if you're looking for your X intercept, you could type in Y equals zero and it'll highlight to there. Then you should be able to hit enter again and it'll bounce you to the next one. Right? Or you type in X equals zero and it'll bring you right there. Right? And you, it'll give you a value and it'll spit that out. So you can double check to make sure that you, you're getting the right values there. Okay, um, so again, you can hit calculate feature to avoid the act activate menu. Um, and, and look, there you go. So it'll look something like this. It'll look something like this. Um, and, and most of the time you can enter a value as X equals zero, right? Um, so most of the time it'll be set up so you'll have it set to X um, and then you can scroll through and, and make sure that you've got it right. Or when it says right bound, that just means the little arrows. Right, so you can scroll through the graph and it'll actually take you through the entire graph and the values will change here. Okay, um, then, then this is good one for intersecting points. Okay, so um, when we're looking for, um, when we're looking for those intersections, um, we can type in multiple graphs there and then you can see, well, okay, here's two solutions. Right? And you can actually calculate the value, you can scroll through till you find the value, or you can just use this as a nice way of checking. Um, unfortunately, I wish there was a way of doing inequalities, but there isn't at this point. But you can still plot them as if there were equal signs and then figure out the shading later. Okay, um, and, and again, once you plot both of these, you can choose the intersect button. Okay, you can choose the intersect button. All right, um, and then once you hit intersect, uh, you will let it know you're looking at, sorry, you'll know you'll let it looking at Y1 and Y2, okay? And the cursor is gonna jump, so it'll start on one, so it'll start on this first one, so Y1, you'll hit enter, right? And then it'll go to uh, Y2, you hit enter, all right? Um, and then, and then um, as long as you're relatively close, right? So it's not like you're up here and all the way over there. Okay, as long as you're relatively close, um, it's gonna get you an answer pretty quickly here, okay? Um, and we'll be dealing with 99% of the time, we're gonna be dealing with um, whole numbers, okay? So most of the time we'll be dealing with whole numbers. Um, so it shouldn't take that long anyways, okay? Um, I know that was super quick here. Do we have any immediate questions on calculators, on putting calculators in the right function, on finding graphs? Okay. Um, again, 
please, please reach out to me if you have questions. But what I will say is, is the way that I learn most of my calculator things is by either reading instructions like that or just clicking on buttons and seeing what happens, right? Um, and I know that's not the right time to do that on your test, um, but making sure that you can click through and, and look at that different stuff will be super, super helpful, okay? Um, now, uh, make, sure, make sure you can hear me and that you can hit something on your, your iPad. Um, we're about 45 minutes into class here. Now, I'm gonna let you guys choose what you would like to do. 